So it's time to, uh, to introduce our first speaker, who's one of our own. When I say that, I mean City Universities, Cass Business School's own. Uh, so we have Prof Andre Spicer here today, who's kindly given up his time to talk to you guys. And he's going to be telling us about a few things. Um, but I'll let him do that. Just to give you a bit of background about Andre, um, he is a Professor of Organisational Behaviour, uh, but also the Founding Director of Ethos, which is our Centre for Responsible Enterprise at Cass. So he knows a bit of stuff about this, this kind of area. Um, any of you in here a Guardian reader? You, sorry, I'm not shaming you, Ward. <laughs> Any, I'm not, not bringing out your political <laughs> views, um, but you may have seen or read uh, some of Andre's excellent um, uh, work in there, including the year of self-improvement, self self wasn't it? Mm. Uh, there were a couple of experiments, so Andre likes to put himself as the heart of his own experiments, and you may hear a bit about that in his, in his presentation. He's also the author of The Stupidity Paradox, which is very, very interesting. Uh, who considers himself a bit of a stupid person? Oh, there's a bit, yeah, fantastic. Okay, you've got a perfect audience for this. <laughs> so hopefully um, we'll, um, we'll learn something from this, this next session. But without any further delay, um, I'll pass it over to Andre. So thank you very much, Andre. Thank you. Now my plan is to try it without, can you hear me without the microphone? Okay, cool. Um, so I have to admit something to you. Um, I'm, you know, we're on camp now, right? So we've all gone on camp. Um, but I've got to admit something to you. I fucking hate camping. <laughs> this is unusual for a New Zealander because, okay, you'd understand from a British perspective because going camping involves, you know, going out into the rain, some sort of sadistic experiment of getting wet and soggy and so forth for a long period of time. You might like it, that's cool with me. But for me, I've always thought of camping going out, you know, you get rid of all your possessions and you end up eating sand and your food and, uh, you know, it's just unpleasant sitting next to people who you don't really like and they're loud or nice and all sorts of things like that. So I met up with a friend recently and asked him, why do you like going camping so much? And he said, well, there's a few things. Number one is that you kind of get back to what matters, you know, nature, what's important to you, all of those kind of things. And I thought, okay, <coughs> fair enough. The second thing he said is that you get to put aside all of your possessions that you normally carry around with you. We all carry our stuff around with us. Um, and I thought, okay, that's fair enough as well. But I then thought back to my times either going camping in Australia or New Zealand. And what people would do is basically bring not just uh, you know, a tent, but they'd bring a kitchen sink and a, 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 a fridge, even a toilet. Almost like set up a whole little a house to show that they bought with it. So it seemed to defeat that purpose. And the third thing is that they said, well, sometimes you make unusual connections. So I remembered once uh, falling asleep outside on a nice sunny day and one of my friends spat in my ear, which was not the nice connection that you wanted. But nonetheless, I got those three things. So perhaps during this camp we could kind of get those three things. You know, you get to put aside all of the rubbish of everyday life, like those boring meetings you have to go to, the emails you hate so much, and all of those kind of things, uh, and put those aside for a while. The second thing is that hopefully today you might get to make some unusual connections with people. So maybe just talk with at least one person you, don't, you haven't met before, you might find a strange connection. And the third thing is that uh, maybe you might get back to what matters, right? So most of our jobs we spend our time focused on things which uh, don't matter at all. Uh, we know this from psycho uh, sort of psychological workplace research, that most people in that day-to-day -day work find they spend most of their time doing things which they consider completely meaningless to their jobs. Uh, and when people have a good day at work, the thing which marks it out is that you're able to work on something which matters to you and complete a task, right? It's that simple, right? No need for mindfulness meditation or uh, slides in the workplace. Just being able to focus and complete a task which you find meaningful and interesting is what makes a good day work day. So I think hopefully during this camp you might be able to do those three things, like something meaningful uh, and important, make unusual connections and put aside uh, the kind of corporate class in which you spend your day dealing with. So that's kind of a little introductory bit. What I'm going to talk about is a book which uh, we published last year uh, with Profile Books, their centre, their um, headquarters is not too far away from here, called The Stupidity Paradox. So myself and uh, Matt Zalverson, who's kind of a Swedish guy who kind of vaguely resembles the Swedish chef in a strange kind of way, um, spent about a decade uh, going around um, what's called knowledge-intensive workplaces. So this is consultancies, engineering firms, uh, schools, universities, government departments, 
where there are a lot of smart people with good degrees who say we're knowledge workers. And we wanted to get to the bottom of what was actually going on there. And we were struck by the fact that when you spoke with people, when you followed them around, what they said was, well, actually, I do a lot of stupid stuff. And there's a lot of stupidity in this workplace, which is supposed to be knowledge intensive. So we wanted to kind of understand how that plays out and how that works. So I'm going to give you a little bit of a story about how this works. Uh, consider why our knowledge intensive workplaces are often so stupid and encourage us to be stupid and then think about what we might be able to do about it. So let me start with the story. This guy here is, uh, goes by the name Dennis G.R., or Denny if you're an American, which he happens to be. Um, and he was a uh, student radical, you know, back in the day. Spent his time in the 60s and early 70s protesting and so on. And then he thought eventually, okay, better get a job. Um, so he, he went to Ford Motor Corporation, a strange kind of choice for a student radical, but nonetheless, that's where he went. Um, and they did all this, ran all the psychometric tests on him and all those kind of things. Um, and they, they hired this guy. And on his personnel file, there was written the words Crown Prince. So clearly this guy was going places, right? He was on the fast stream. Uh, and his first placement was into um, a part of the organization, which was they called the Recalls Department. Now what happened in the Recalls Department is that a car broke down, or maybe it was in an accident, something went wrong. And that car was then sent to the Recalls Department, and then people like Dennis, who trained as an engineer, or Denny, went through it, looked at what was wrong, identified the problem, and then asked, is there something more systematic here that goes across all organizations, that we are all, all of our uh, cars which we need to fix? So he'd normally spend his days in his office, but maybe a couple of times a week, he'd have to go to a place which they called the Chamber of Horrors, right? And this Chamber of Horrors uh, was essentially a large warehouse we had a lot of burnt out cars, these cars which had been in accidents. And he said, if you actually imagined being in those cars, there was often people in there, there was melted plastic and dripping steel and all crunched up, it was disturbing, right? But he was an engineer, so he had to use his analytical mind to think about this, analyze things very specifically and think, okay, what's the problem here? Uh, look past the, the burnt uh, body remains and think about you know, what's the systematic issue here. So one day he goes down to the Chamber of Horrors and uh, comes across uh, one of these, which is a uh, Ford Pinto. And he sees this Ford Pinto, it's been involved, it's burnt up, right? And he thinks, well, something doesn't feel quite right here. There's a bit of a problem. And he looked at it and then he went back to the office um, and uh, it burnt out like this, it looked like this. He went back to his office and said, well, guys, you know, his, to his older colleagues, this, I've just seen this Ford Pinto, I saw there was this, some problems and, and it just doesn't feel quite right. There seems to be something wrong here. I'd like to pass the issue up, uh, up the chain, uh, look into this a little bit more, maybe go and look at whether there's a deeper problem within the Ford Pinto. And his colleagues responded like this. Right, they laughed at him. They thought, ah, Danny, that's ridiculous. You've got one car here and we're dealing with hundreds of thousands of cars, right? If you want to push this problem up the chain, then you've got to deal with our managers above them, and then above them uh, like that. And if you want to recall all these cars, it's going to cost you millions and millions of, or hundreds, or tens of millions of dollars to do this, right? So do you really want to go through all of this problem? And then as you push past the issue up the chain, people at the top are probably going to question you. And he sort of sat back and thought, well, you know, maybe he's got a point. Uh, I don't really want to spend the next uh, six years of my life dealing with this recall. I'm uh, you know, going to probably move on from this job in the next uh, six months or year as I get circulated around the company. Uh, I don't really want to upset my colleagues that much, right? Because I'm creating more work for them. So he just put it aside and then went on with his day job. Uh, and he was rewarded for that. You know, he kind of you know, climbed up the bureaucracy, uh, didn't have too many problems, uh, you know, he was promoted, all those kind of things. Uh, but the only problem was, a few years later, it turned out that the Ford Pinto, as some of you probably know, had a fatal design flaw in it, right? So the fatal design flaw is this, the gas tank, the fuel tank was in the back of the car uh, and there was insufficient project protection between the fuel tank and uh, the back of the car, which meant if you are a car that rammed into the back of the uh, Ford Pinto, you would turn the uh, car in front of you into a flaming uh, fireball. Um, and if, have any, many of you have probably watched Fight Club before the film, right? So Edward Norton's character is based on one of these guys who was assessing uh, insurance claims around uh, the Ford Pinto. Um, 
and uh, it caused a national scandal. So people were writing on the back of my, their Ford Pintos, keep off the back. I think about 100, uh, 100 people died in these Ford Pintos. Um, they then eventually had, there were thousands who were in, uh, fate, you know, very seriously injured. Um, and then they had to recall it. It costs, uh, I think, hundreds of millions to do a recall. They had to pay out huge amounts in insurance claims, etc., etc. So this one oversight here of looking at something in more depth, you know, pushing it up the organisation, led to, in the short term, fairly good outcomes, which was this person getting ahead, not causing problems within the organisation. But in the longer term, this oversight uh, from a very smart person seemed to lead to some very profound, troubling, uh, and um, unethical and costly uh, outcomes. So this seemed to be a kind of classic example in many ways of what we call the stupidity paradox. Smart people who voluntarily almost stupefy themselves, right? They say, I know there's a problem here, but hey, I'm not going to think about it too much. And as a result, they're rewarded for that in the short term, and everyone else around them benefits. But in the longer term, it sometimes can have quite serious consequences. <coughs> so that's the basic idea of what we want to get across in the book. Now, Denny has gone on, and his new career, can you guess what it is? Same thing as me, business school professor. <laughs> so that's what you do after you've uh, caused lots of problems. So in many ways, the basic argument to sort of repeat in the book is this. Top organizations, like Ford at the time or anyone else, wants to appear smart. They market themselves as, we're super intelligent, we have smart solutions, we're knowledge intensive, all of those ideas. Uh, so they tend to hire the best and the brightest people, like the people kind of sitting in this room, very intelligent, you know, passionate about their work, all of those kind of things. Now, the difficult thing with smart people is they like to think independently, right? You've been trained and bought into this for, for many years, you want to use your independent thought. But, this tends to be kind of inconvenient, right? So it creates problems in your organization. If you point out something and say, hey, this is an issue, we need to deal with it, uh, it creates the group around you, oh, it's more work, further pe pe people further up in the organization, oh, this is going to create problems, this is going to be costly, etc., etc. Um, so firms need to manage stupidity, right? They don't just need to manage knowledge, they also need to manage stupidity. Um, and often individuals, smart people, very quickly realize, hey, it doesn't pay to be too smart, to use your intelligence all the time. So often they voluntarily begin to sort of dumb themselves down, and sometimes even when they're mentoring or whatever, other people around them say, hey, don't think about that too much, don't ask too many questions. Uh, and it pays off. This is the thing, is it pays off often, at least in the short term. And as all of you know from behavioural economics, we have this thing called hyperbolic discounting, where the bird in the hand is worth two in the bush, right? If I give, say to you, which I did with my students recently, um, here's uh, five quid. Do you want five quid now uh, or ten quid next week? All of them will say, I want five quid now, right? So we all, we all tend to have the short-term focus. We overvalue the short-term and we significantly undervalue any long-term gains. This is shown in all sorts of experiments uh, all the time. So it pays off in the short term, but, in, but it can create problems in the longer term, right? So it, it, it kind of creates these smaller problems, which then over time, these sometimes uh, problems can sometimes get lost or forgotten or overlooked. Large organizations are big places, and they're fantastically... Um, great at forgetting things, right? We Often the reason, if, if many of you have been in, involved in corporate restructures, what happens is this. We're going to centralise, right? Five years later, what are we going to do? Decentralise. And then centralise, decentralise, and, and like this and that, just constantly swinging backwards and forwards. So corporations need a very, very huge amount, a big supply of forgetfulness to, to constantly undergo these kind of restructures. So in the short term, these things can be overlost and forgotten, but often they can add up to disasters, right? And if you look at many of the kind of big corporate disasters which we've seen in the last, you know, decade or so, or over a longer period, you see exactly this happening. VW's emission scandal, what happened there? Smart engineers who thought, who were given this goal, okay, you need to bring down emissions. It was impossible um, because top management hadn't actually thought about how you technically implement that. So they go away, come up with a technical fix, which is cheating on it, um, and, and then they implement it, which was fine for a while, but then it created this longer-term consequence, which was the company nearly went out of business. Now, the interesting thing with VW is, do you know that they did exactly the same thing 
about 30 years ago. So they were fined by, they manipulated emissions, they were fined by the EPA, and they said, oh no, never again, we'll never, never do it. And then, you know, they forget, do the same thing again. Um, the banks, I've spent, you know, probably most of my time at CAS looking at how banks operate, and there seems to be a huge supply of uh, strategic stupidity in, in the banking sector. Uh, of, of overlooking things, forgetting things, not even knowing what the models which they develop mean or how they work. Um, and the other thing I'm st always <coughs> struck with is that people go out of their way to try and show you how smart they are using this <coughs> jargon and nonsense and so on, but when you actually try to dig below the surface, there's not a lot of intelligence going on there. Tesco, with uh, their scandal around accounting, uh, and more recently the pricing scandal, which they still haven't fixed, which is basically if you go into a Tesco <coughs> shop, look at the price prices on the... Um, on the, 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 you know, the, the thing, and then take the thing to the, to the uh, counter, often there'll be a big difference between those two prices. They just haven't even <laughs> fixed that, and they're still doing it. Uh, and the NHS, there's many examples of these kinds of, uh, you know, um, very smart people in the NHS overlooking things strategically because it will take, uh, cre create too many problems, and it then creates either huge um, capacity overruns or problems over time. And you could go on and on. So we wanted to then understand what is the stupidity, how does it work? And there are different ways of understanding it. So when you probably heard the word stupidity, this is kind of the image which may have come to mind. You know, Charlie Chaplin in Modern Life where he's basically overworked and then he goes crazy and he starts going around the, the, um, the factory trying to screw on people's noses and creating problems for all his workers. So many of you have probably worked with at least maybe one individual like this who's either crazy or just mentally deficient or something like this who just creates problems for everyone else in the system, right? So there's that. But surprise, surprise, this tends to be we know about it, it's high profile, but it's actually fairly rare, right? It may be more common than we expect, but it still happens. What's more common is this kind of thing. So do any of you know who this character is? Dr. Strangelove, Dr. right? So extremely intelligent, super smart. Uh, he, this guy was actually based on a real life uh, Cold War um, strategist in the, in the, uh, the Kennedy uh, government. You know, using game theory to try and work out the ultimate way of destroying the world through nuclear weapons, right? So super smart, uh, kind of good outcome maybe in the short term, but in the long term, the, the outcome is completely ridiculous. Destruction of the world. So we wanted to understand this kind of strange Lovian sort of stupidity. Now, how could we understand it? We went to the literature, we read, read loads and loads of um, books and studies and all of these kind of things on it. And um, we kind of then started to say, well, what are the common features? And we thought there were three common features here. Number one, the first common feature was this, which is uh, functional stupidity involves not questioning your assumptions, right? You make some assumptions, but you don't question it, right? You don't look into what assumptions am I making here? What's going on, okay? That's the first, uh, first aspect. The second aspect is uh, a lack of justification. Just do it. Don't ask why, just do it. We just need to, to hit this target. Why? Well, because there's a target, right? Uh, we need to do this. Why? Well, who knows? We need to rebrand. Who knows why we're doing it, but we need to do it, right? So a lack of justification about why we're doing things. And the final thing is a lack of thinking about what our longer-term goals are, the ends are. So, you know, short-termism, a lack of sort of, you might have immediate goals, but a lack of sense of what, what's the broader purpose of why we're doing all of this. Um, so then the question we sort of started to ask ourselves is why is this happening? Why are smart people doing all of these things? Not asking, questioning their assumptions, not um, thinking about longer term goals and, uh, and not giving justifications. Now there's lots of literature, if any of you kind of have watched a few TED talks you probably know this. Uh, one would say, well, it's because of information overload, right? No matter how smart you are, you're hit with all of this information all of the time. Um, and, and then it becomes very difficult to kind of work out what the important information is to attend to and uh, not. Okay, so that's one potential explanation, and there's lots of organization theory which tells us about it. And we've kind of in some ways developed deep ways of dealing with it, but it's one factor. A second factor, and this is a common explanation, is to say, well, uh, large organizations are full of people who are analytically intelligent, but they, they, those people tend to be lacking in other forms of intelligence. So normally you would have been told e, uh, EQ, so emotional quotient. Uh, by the way, that's quite poor, res uh, bad quality research. This is a, from a guy called Robert Sternberg, who's a major sort of guy in the intelligence, um, psychologist in the intelligence literature. And he sort of says, well, there are actually three forms of intelligence you can measure in people on. 
creative intelligence, practical intelligence, and analytical intelligence. And one of the big problems in many knowledge intensive firms is you hire people on one of these dimensions, particularly analytical intelligence, and then they might not have these other forms of intelligence. Okay, that might be a, a, another reason. A third reason, and this is the most common, is the kind of Daniel Kahneman uh, cognitive bias type idea, that essentially our brains have two systems at work. System one is the fast reaction habitual system, um, and it runs essentially on rules of thumb, uh, cognitive biases. Um, when I give you a problem, you react in a very quick way. And most of us as professionals, the reason you're a professional is because of your finely uh, honed system one, which is this holistic, uh, quick reaction system. Um, but the problem is this is plagued by biases and you make mistakes all the time. There's all sorts of different, there's a list of I think a hundred different cognitive biases. One being things like self-serving bias. If you, you put it forward a suggestion, you're going to collect information which supports your suggestion, right? And ignore other people's uh, suggestions. System two is the rational thinking system, right? So this is the system which makes deliberative, slow, rational analysis. Uh, and the idea here is that uh, stupidity, functional stupidity will dominate when this system here, system one, dominates. And this happens often, but not all the time. But what we noticed is spending time in, say, management consultancies, engineering firms, etc., is that there were lots of cases where people weren't just act, asked to react quickly, therefore you'd expect system one to be at work. But they had time uh, to reflect think about stuff, etc. And they didn't seem to, they still seem to make stupid decisions. Another example of this, there was a study done at Harvard where they got uh, some undergraduate students and then some uh, very practiced, uh, smart, intelligent managers. And they gave them a case study, basically. So instead, normally you'd give a case study to students in uh, a package, like, you know, 10 pages, and they'd read through it. The only difference here is they gave them a case study on cards, like, so one sentence per card or one piece of information per card. Now, the students sit, sat there and waited for all of the information to come to them before they made a decision. What did the uh, practice uh, seasoned managers do, do you think? You presented one piece of information per card. When did they try and start solving the problem? Immediately. Pretty much immediately, right? They hadn't seen all the information they wanted to solve it. They were told, there's no time pressure, you can just do what you want, but they just wanted to immediately begin solving the problem. And when they dug into this, and this was common in what we observed in corporations, why they were doing it, we asked them, why? And they said, I want to appear action-oriented. A good manager is someone who makes decisions, gets stuff done, <coughs> makes things happen, even when you don't necessarily under time pressure. So it seemed to be largely about creating the right kind of image, rather than actually coming to the right sort of decision. So this was what we saw. It wasn't just something about the way in which our brain psychology worked. It seemed to be something about the way people wanted to present themselves and also the way the organizations were designed. So we sort of tried to then formulate a different idea around this, which was sort of, uh, instead of focusing on the structure of our brains, we wanted to focus on how our organizations are designed. And the basic argument, the kind of what we came to was this, that we live in basically what we call an economy of persuasion. Um, there were some, some um, economists in uh, Australia, the Australian Federal Reserve, who recently did an analysis of the UK, uh, the US economy. And they found that 30% of the U US economy is basically persuasion, right? So this is people selling stuff, marketing, PR, basically what are they producing? It's just image, right? They're producing image, hot air, and persuasion. 30% of the economy is this. Uh, so in this economy of persuasion, what gets produced and what gets valued is a nice argument, a nice image. So in many cases, organizations in this economy are rewarded, uh, this is private, public, and non-profit, not necessarily for the substance of what they're delivering, but the image, the rhetoric, what they're telling people that they're delivering, the image which they're presenting. So if you look at what a CEO does with his time, there are people who have followed around CEOs and looked at what they spend their time doing. Uh, they spend between 30 and 50% talking with um, analysts, right? So these are people who work for large banks, you know, 20, 30, 40 years old, you know, quite young, generally speaking, who are analyzing uh, what they're worth and giving a price to the stock market. They don't spend their time looking at what's going on in the organization. They're more about keeping up this nice facade with the, the, the stock market analysts. And this is what many organizations spend their time doing, deciding on what the facade is. We did some work recently with the um, UK Parliament, um, so you know, the people who run Parliament, 
and I asked the central people, the kind of major people there, what's the first kind of decision rule? What's the decision rule on your mind when you make a decision about something? And do you know what their answer was? What would this look like on the Daily Mail, right? <laughs> That's the number one test. We did some work with people from the senior people from Transport for London. Do you know what their number one test was? The Evening Standard test. What would this look like in the Evening Standard? So often, people at the very top of the organisation, the number one thing on their mind is, what is this going to look like on the front page? What are my investors going to think about this? Not like, what is the longer term issue? It's, what is the facade looking like? And most of effort, uh, you know, things that go into corporate life is about facade creation, creating this nice facade which, which looks great, but there might not necessarily be anything behind this. Now the problem is that there are things behind the facade, and it's people like you, right? Smart people who are keeping the organisation going, delivering the things on a day-to-day -day level, right? And they know that there's this facade and you have to keep it up, that's important, fair enough. But sometimes it's a bit difficult to, when you have a bit of a difference between the rhetoric and the reality, right? So we're putting up this rhetoric, we're top 20 university in the world and we're knowledge intensive and powerful thinking and all that sort of stuff. But if you actually go and look on what's going on behind that facade, it often looks quite difficult and it's hard to keep up that distance. So as a smart person, you're saying, well, it's pretty tough. So <clears throat> then how you react is to sort of almost uh, how the organisations and how individuals react is to almost sort of uh, encourage people not to think too much, right? So this works through systems, uh, processes, which I'll talk about soon, but also um, informal processes. So when we were looking at, say, consulting groups, you'd have a, a young person who comes up with a good solution. They do lots of analysis. They come up with a solution that's actually right for the client. And then they're told by the person running the team, hey, don't think too much. We've got to deliver a nice PowerPoint presentation tomorrow. Don't focus on the solution. Focus on coming up with a nice PowerPoint deck, right? So junior consultants spent more of their time polishing the PowerPoint deck than they actually came up doing, do coming up with the solution. So this idea that thinking sometimes causes more problems than comes up with solutions. And as a result, you have an organisation of people who are willing to put their head in the sand because they just don't want to see all of the issues and all of the problems around them. And it's easier that way, right? Um, and life, in that case, can be quite sweet, right? You don't get to see all of the problems around you. Uh, you can kind of just go along, do your task, life is fine. And the other thing is that people around you start to like you. You don't create problems, so that's like, this is a great person, you know? They come with solutions, not problems. They fix things, it's great. They're not creating too many problems for me. I remember when I got my first academic job, uh, my PhD advisor, his number one piece of advice was, show that you're not going to scare the horses, right? So show that you're gonna come in and not create problems, essentially. So it seems to be quite sort of common. People are, like, are going to reward you for it. Uh, and you're going to climb up the, the corporate hierarchy as a result. Um, and sometimes companies benefit, right? So, you know, create a nice facade to the financial markets, the price goes up, you know, everything's cheery and great. But the problem is that this can often lead to oversights, problems, people uh, overlooking things. Um, and as I mentioned, that sometimes that's not an issue because you might see the problem, but corporations have these revolving doors, people are coming and going, and it's quite easy to forget where problems actually exist <laughs> many times. But sometimes they can add up to, these small problems can add up to large scale screw ups in some, time, in some cases, which is, you know, things like this or, uh, you know, disasters of various kinds, which can uh, be, you know, not just in the company, but systemic, like the banking crisis. So I guess the kind of argument here is that we live in an economy of persuasion, which incentivizes organizations to focus on symbols rather than substance. Whoops. Uh, this creates a gap between rhetoric and reality, and when people, uh, which people deal with through functional stupidity, sort of dumbing themselves down. Um, this pays off for individuals and organisations in the short term, but it leads to mistakes which build up to crises in the longer term. So that's the basic kind of argument about why this, why this works. So the next question is, how is this functional stupidity designed into organisations? How is it encouraged? And we see well, there's many things, but there were five things which we saw were quite common. Number one was overemphasis on leadership, right? Too much uh, a mystical belief in the power that leadership is going to make organizations great again. 
Um, so there's a study which was done recently by a guy called Jeff Pfeffer, who's a well-known Stanford business professor, and the title of the book is Leadership BS. Uh, and one of his headlines findings is this, that the US spends, American businesses spend something like 3.6, I think, can't remember the figure exactly, but it's something like 3.6 billion a year on leadership development. And if you look at the effectiveness of it, it's basically zero, right? So they're spending $3.6 billion a year and there's very little effect on the actual quality of American uh, business leaders. Uh, if you actually look at the content of what gets delivered on leadership development courses, I've, I, I've run some myself, I try and focus on the evidence, but you can, if you look at it more broadly, um, you see people being sent to dress as a ninja for a day. Uh, I've been on one where I was taught to beatbox, uh, which was about kind of developing an effective team. Um, you find people who are uh, sent to kind of run around naked in the woods, uh, climb up walls. Uh, my favorite one was horse whispering. So you go out and the slogan for this company was equine assisted develop delivery. And their slogan was, you can lead people, but can you lead a horse? <laughs> so the point is that this, there's just so much ridiculous stuff which goes on in this area of leadership development. You can call any, almost anything leadership development if you like, and it's fine. Um, and, and often uh, leaders themselves have a mystical belief in their own powers. So if you actually look at people, and we spent years following around leaders, and we asked them, we and said, okay, tell me about your leadership style. You might say, oh, I'm an authentic leader, and I like to coach people, and all that sort of stuff. And then I go and talk with your report. So tell me about when he does leadership, and you'll, you'll go, uh, well, I can't really remember <laughs> any time he did any leadership, or maybe he did this, and then we observed. So often there's a lot of talk about leadership, but it often happens like one or two percent of the actual time. Most of the time, middle managers sit in meetings with other middle managers um, and they, they, uh, they, they send emails and they communicate and there's very little leadership going on and that's actually okay, right? But there's a lot of talk and fantasy about people being leaders, uh, which is sometimes a little bit misplaced, let's say. Um, the second thing we saw is basically bureaucracy, you know, rules, regulations, those kind of things. So one, uh, one, one organization we looked at here was um, a, a, a local authority, local government in Sweden. And we went and talked with the guy who was running this authority and he said, well, the regulators came in and they asked for uh, 30 different policies around a particular area. I wanted to see 30 different policies. So they went away again. And what did he do? He wrote a list of 30 policies. They came back the next year, saw the 30 policies, and that was fine. Did they do anything else beyond coming up with a list of 30 policies? No. He basically said, we spent so much time developing the policies that we had no time to actually implement them, right? And this is what you often see in organizations where they come up with what we call spectacular regulation. One small thing goes wrong, then you have to come up with all of this regulatory reporting requirements and this, that, and the other thing, and policies and procedures and all those kind of things, and nothing actually changes apart from the policies which are put forward. Um, so there's focus on the substance, or the image rather than the substance. Uh, and you know, there's uh, the obvious stuff about sort of uh, rule following and so on. The third thing we saw is corporate imitation. Um, a legendary um, chair uh, business person uh, who's the chair of uh, Handelsbanken, which was like, the only bank during the financial crisis in Europe that actually grew rather than declined. He uh, made the point that um, uh, business leaders or CEOs are like teenagers choosing genes. So if their, their, their fellow CEOs does it, that they're going to do it as well. Rip genes today? Okay, yeah, they, they, uh, they want it, I'll do the same. Uh, uh, higher genes, lower genes, different colored genes, they'll, they'll repeat the same thing. The same thing in corporations. You're doing TQM today. Okay, I want to do TQM. Uh, you're doing, um, I don't know, agile. Yeah, I'm going to do that as well. So there's a huge amount of copying within industries. We often think that companies are supposed to distinguish themselves and make themselves different, but what they spend most of their time doing is copying. The most shocking example of this I've come across recently, there was a study which showed that when CEOs go golfing with their buddies, and their buddy has done a, a merger and acquisition, they're far more likely for them to do a merger and acquisition next, right? So mergers and acquisitions, which we know something like eight or nine times out of 10 fail. They fail to deliver on their objectives and they actually lose money most of the time. This is done because their, their buddies have gone golfing. They want to be like their buddies, right? So this, this is kind of the sort of stupidity which we see very frequently. 
A third, for fourth form of stupidity which we see is brand-induced stupidity. Um, so we did some work uh, looking at the Swedish armed forces and we found out that they, at one point in time, decided that they were going to launch a new branding initiative where they changed the logo, they changed all of the plates, the, sy the symbols, you know, army people have these flags that they're very proud of, they changed all of these insignias and all of this sort of stuff, created a lot of uproar, but it cost millions and millions and millions to do this. So as a result of this branding exercise, they had to cancel military exercises, right? They're spending more money on rebranding the organization rather than actually uh, delivering on their core purpose, which is to run military exercises. Uh, similar thing we saw in, um, in, uh, in say, um, if you look at many rebranding, you just see how ridiculous it is. So for instance, Western Sydney University recently branded itself as, uh, uh, sorry, the West, University of the West of Sydney recently spent about a million and rebranded itself as Western Sydney University. Uh, about 10 years ago, National Australia Bank, uh, the Australian National Bank rebranded itself as National Australia Bank. Um, and Opera Australia rebranded itself as Australia. Australian Opera rebranded itself as Opera Australia. And this kind of stuff happens all the time where there's this huge process of rebranding and you often end up with the same kind of uh, thing at the end of the day. The final kind of example of this which we saw was, uh, w was uh, functional stupidity being encouraged by culture, in particular cultures of action orientation and positivity. So one great example of this which we saw was uh, Nokia. So if you looked at uh, when the smartphone was launched, essentially Nokia had in place a culture of only come to us with solutions, not problems, right? So if you came and you didn't have an upbeat message for, for the senior managers, it would be either disregarded or your, your, um, your uh, you know, division or whatever would be downsized or you might be got rid of. Now what often happened was um, there was a big problem at the time, if you remember they were developing this system called Symbian, and there was lots of problems with the, user, the operational interface. Users didn't really like it that much for one reason or another. Most people who were actually developing the system within Nokia knew this, right? But they also knew that if they said, hey, there's a problem with Symbian, talk with people further up in the organization, they'd be, probably be punished for that because they were being negative, right? So they didn't, ta basically people, there was this conspiracy of silence. They didn't know, they knew that there was something going wrong, but they didn't want to appear negative, so they didn't uh, push this concern upwards. As a result, Nokia continued to develop Symbian for about a year longer than they should have, should have, um, and uh, you know Microsoft, uh, sorry, uh, I, I, the iPhone, um, Apple, and also Samsung accelerated ahead. Well, they struggled to launch a functional smartphone. They launched one late. Uh, they were late to the market. Where's Nokia now? Doesn't really. Well, they're not really making smartphones anymore. Well, they've recently relaunched, but it's owned by someone else, right? So the point here is that this kind of culture of positivity, uh, po pro solutions rather than problems, can sometimes lead to very big issues. So the final question we need to then ask is, okay, we have these cultures of stupidity, lots of forces encouraging us to, to, uh, to not think too much. What should we do about it? And there are, five, I think, five or six things which we point out. One is the role of devil's advocates. If you have in a group uh, one person who, whose job it is to say, no, this doesn't work, here are the questions, uh, critiquing, questioning, it's likely that that group, um, psychological studies have shown us, that this group is likely to come to better decisions. They're going to like the process less, take more time, but the decisions are going to be better. Even if that devil's advocate is saying something which is completely wrong, but their job is to disagree with the group, it will prompt thinking within the group and they're likely to come to a better solution. So perhaps organizations more need more DAs, devil's advocates, rather than the load of PAs, personal admin, illustration assistance that they have. The second thing is that organizations need to learn from their mistakes, right? So um, the basic thing that maybe some of you do is post-mortems, you know, a project dies, what went wrong, and try and build the learning in, which is quite strangely quite rare process, but that needs to happen. But a, a, a second process you can do before your projects die is what's called a pre-mortem. So when you begin a new project, the idea is this. You get a group of experts around the table and you say, let's imagine in three years this project is utterly screwed up. There's something gone terribly wrong here. The experts around the table sort of shake their head and say, yeah, yeah, I know what's gone wrong. And they say, you say to the group of experts, write down three or five things that have gone wrong. And everyone will tend to come up with this list of similar three or five things. 
I mean, the second thing that, was, that you can then say is, what should we do to make sure that doesn't happen? Then you can come up with a list of things. Now, this does two things. One is it's basic contingency planning, right? It helps you to work out the contingencies. That's important. But the really important thing is that it gets rid of what's called self-serving bias. That whenever we begin a project, we think it's going to take half the amount of time and cost half as much as it actually does. So any of you who have done any home renovations know that this is certainly the case. I think there was an American study done on kitchen renovations and the average people, when you ask them how much is this going to cost before, it's about half of what it actually costs uh, that, that they think about it's going to cost before. This is the same thing with most projects, right? But when you get people to think about the worst case scenario when you begin, you actually get rid of that self-serving bias and people begin to think, hey, this is actually going to be more tough than we think it is, so let's prepare for it. Uh, third thing you can do is harness the power of outsiders. So people who are coming in from outside of the organization, whether this is new recruits, uh, secondees, etc. So often these people will see the weird, strange, and bizarre things which you just treat as normal. So for instance, when we were doing some work with a large bank, uh, you know, we came in, the first thing you saw on the left was the biggest thing was the share price, right? And then you go up and they say, oh, we want to play down the importance of short-term share prices and think about ethics and all this sort of stuff. And you say, well, just look in your head, you know, the, the, the uh, lift. This is, tells your employees all they need to know about what, what's important to the company. So sometimes outsiders see these things which people in the organization don't see. The fourth thing, and this is something I've just come across recently, um, is, is the importance of actually getting people to think through how something works. Right? So there was a study which was done at Yale about, te uh, actually about, yeah, about 15 years ago, where they got people, it's a very simple thing, they got people in the audience or, you know, this experimental subjects to say, you know, how much do you, sir, know about toilets? And most people would say, yeah, I know quite a lot about toilets. You know, I, I use them all the time. They're quite, you know, it's quite a simple device. And people would say, well, I know nine out of, my expertise on toilets is nine out of ten. Right? And I say, okay, good. And then I say to you, now tell me precisely in as much detail as possible how the <coughs> toilet works. Right? And then they'll start thinking about it and they'll, well, I actually don't know. Right? And then I go back to you and say, so tell me, how much do you know, 9 out of, ten, uh, out of a 10-point scale, how much you know about toilets? And it's going to go rapidly down. Right? And you're then more likely to listen to outside facts. This also holds for extreme uh, political positions as well. So if you have, for instance, a climate change denier, and they have some favoured policy, and, and they tell you the policy, you basically give them information, they'll ignore all information which doesn't support their position and take on information which does, the same to the other the other's process. If you actually give ask them, how is your policy actually going to work in as much detail, causality, they're likely then to begin listening to facts. So this is what you can do in some cases to bring down what's called the illusion of understanding. Most people in organizations think they know how things work. But as you probably all know, we have no idea how they work. So if you say to them, how is your proposal actually going to work? What are the mechanics of how this is going to work? They'll begin to reduce their sort of own uh, self-serving biases and be more likely to listen to experts like yourself and facts around the issue. And the final thing is just a bit of humor, right? So you can go and download these uh, bullshit bingo uh, you know, uh, tech cards if you'd like to. Uh, and I think just laughing out the kind of ridiculousness of a lot of corporate uh, language sometimes is sort of an important thing. And it might help us to strip out some of the corporate clutter which we have and get to the more serious issues. So, you know, to kind of conclude, I guess, uh, you know, there are some sort of nice quotes, human stupidity has always been with us, but, you know, there are two things which are infinite, human universe and human stupidity, and Einstein wasn't sure about the universe. Birch and Russell, the whole problem with the world is that fools and fanatics are always so certain of themselves and wise people are so full of doubts. And then my favourite, Gustav Flaubert, to be self a stupid, selfish and have good health are three requirements for happiness. Though if stupidity is lacking, all is lost. So I think I'll end it there and uh, be happy to respond to any questions and so forth that you have. Thank you so much, Andre. Any questions in the room? Any toilet rankings? <laughs> Strong 8 out of 10, I think, for me. <laughs> yeah. yeah, over here. Um, you gave the example of the, the fintech in the beginning um, and how long it took for to acknowledge there was a problem. Yeah. Is there any difference, do you feel, between uh, engineering 
of physical items compared to digital engineering and perhaps speed of change? Yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a really good question. Um, there's, I think there's two differences, I, I, I'd say, so I'm, I'm not an absolute expert at this, but these are two, two things which we observe. When you have a physical um, item, the feedback can sometimes be very clear and obvious, right? Dead people, right? Whereas when you're dealing with a digital, a digital object, sometimes the, the feedback can be very clear and obvious, like beds not being assigned or something like that. But sometimes the, the feedback is virtualized and a more, bit more difficult to understand, right? So sometimes when, when something is kind of virtual, it's easier to... Pro I think the basic <laughs> argument is that when there's a virtual aspect of things, uh, stupidity is far more likely than when there's direct f physical feedback in some ways. Uh, and, and I guess the difficulty here is that you all, being experts in this digital universe, will see the direct outcomes, but for those people who are not experts, that outcome isn't as obvious as a, a, you know, a burnt out car or a dead baby or something like this, would be one response. I think the second thing which you're asking is around this change dynamic, so when you have the speed of change uh, does that give rise to more stupidity? Absolutely. So there was a study which was done, um, actually a stream of research which was done about do good leaders need to be intelligent, right? Normally it's the case that the higher IQ you have, the better your, your leadership quality will be, generally speaking. But there's an exception to this, which is um, under situations of stress. So when there's high time pressure, uh, intelligence often doesn't make a difference. Um, so essentially what only happens is intelligent people just talk, take, talk more, right? Uh, so the weird thing is that in organizations, what often happens is that sometimes there's real time pressure, but I'd say about 80% of when you have time pressure, it's kind of, uh, it's, it's created time pressure, if you'd like, that, 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 that you don't need to respond. So often there's this creation of stress, so people just make decisions quickly and things happen. So it's like when you go into a clothing store, right? So what they want to do often in most clothing stores like H&M and so forth, they want to make, create a quite unpleasant environment. Why? So you do something quickly, you don't think about it too much and you want to get out of there as quickly as possible. Uh, this is my recent experience when I went to Ikea. You wanted to like go in there, you start going crazy and I just started picking things up and then I got out of there as quickly as possible. I think some organizations are like this in the same way. They want to create this huge amount of pressure on people, which sometimes is real, but sometimes it's rather fake. So then they just start reacting using the system one me uh, process and uh, often end up making rather stupid decisions. So thanks. <coughs> yes. Um, in the digital space, clearly we think we'll make a very different product from the car manufacturer. Of course, yeah. And as such, we've kind of gone and invented our own rules. Yeah. Some of which being now copied. Mm -hmm. I hear the car industry is going agile. Yeah, I can't think absolutely. of a more terrifying idea. <laughs> yeah. Do you think that's a huge mistake? Do you think there's a lot more that we could learn from other industries? Yeah, I mean, I don't know enough about your industry. Uh, but generally speaking, yes, I think there's... Often organizational problems aren't as unusual. So most industries are obsessed with themselves, right? And they only tend to learn from each other. It's the same thing as organizations. Middle managers learn from other middle managers. They don't look upwards or downwards most of the time. So something like Agile, for instance, has spread out into other sectors, but it's you kind of talk with each other a lot of the time and you then don't think, okay, what are similarities or differences elsewhere? Now, there's unlikely to be kind of grand silver bullets, but what you're likely to find is that the problems which you face, yes, there's some specificity, but there's also generalities, right? There are general issues. Uh, and probably learning, learning from other industries, yes, is vi vitally important. Uh, and it might be a short circuit to this problem of when you're just essentially copying each other in, in, the, in, in your own industry. So it's an excellent point. Yes, sir. You mentioned these cognitive biases. Yeah. For example, the Dunning-Kruger effect, uh, yeah. brilliantly exemplified by a certain head of government at the moment. <laughs> um, what methods or um, things can we put in place to help us notice these things that make us act stupid and uh, to get back on track, basically? Yeah, so there's, there's, at the moment there's a kind of a rising literature on, de like just focusing on cognitive biases, on debiasing. Right, uh, and so one of them is just being aware of your biases tends to tends to sort of decrease them a little bit. 
but but humans are really bad at actually you know if you want to change your life the worst thing you can do is rely on yourself right so if you want to lose weight the worst thing you can do is say I'm going to use my willpower to lose weight you're actually probably going to gain more weight during that the best thing you can do is change your environment around you right so what we know from all of the behavioral science literature is that humans are weak and if you want to change their behavior the best way you can do is to change the uh, the environment around them so if you want to lose weight, you get all get rid of all the fatty stuff and sugary stuff from your fridge, right? Because we're lazy, we'll just go into the fridge and pick out whatever's there. You can do the same thing in organizations by changing the sort of design of things and prompts around people. That's that's one debiasing strategy. There are a whole bunch of other other things that um, there's a woman called Kathleen Milkman who works at uh, Wharton, who's kind of come up with this quite a nice paper she's come up with, which lists these <coughs> debiasing strategies. It's, one of them. The other one which was mentioned, I noticed there was something in the FT this morning which was about recruitment and selection. Um, and uh, one thing which is being used there is that there's always these cognitive biases about, you know, homophily, which is basically we want to pick people who are like us rather than the best person for the job. And one way to get around that is to rely on models rather than human intuition, right? So there's a big, big role here for computer scientists uh, coming up with modeling decisions which gives a, a solution. Uh, rather than just relying on individual biases. Thanks. Great. We've probably got time for one more question, and then we'll move on. Any others in the room? Yep, one here. So, I mean, going on the same kind of story is that, to your point about <coughs> what complexity, humans are very hard at making complex decisions, especially long-term ones. Yeah. Um, and organizations are as well. So yeah. when you're talking about how we work as businesses with other corporations, mm -hmm. how do you how do you nudge people to use the term as quite what you use mm -hmm. to make smarter decisions? Yeah. And is that something that you've, you've looked at? Yeah, I mean, so so in some ways this list of five things are nudges to make smarter decisions, right? So one number one, have someone who's there to disagree with you. Number two, uh, have, I mean, again, with this debiasing, have... Uh, use probability, you know, like what's going to happen in the future. Normally we ask is like, is this going to happen or is that going to happen? Ask questions about probability or uh, make a decision and then revisit it again, right? Sometimes that's a useful way of rethinking your biases. Um, there's a whole bunch of other kind of potential statistics. Get, yeah, get someone who's going to disagree with you. Get people to think about how something's actually going to work. So all of these things are basically about shifting from relying on our biases to to um, to 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 relying on our slow, more deliberative uh, thinking functions, and there are there are many ways in which you can kind of design them. Into yeah. So I, I guess I'm thinking about can you create systems that help nudge people to make the right decisions sure. outside of those five things? So if people yeah. are taking financial, yeah, you know, if you're creating something around financial services, for example, yeah. how do you make people make smart decisions? Yeah. And how do you get the client to understand that it needs to go through this process, you know, from a digital product development perspective, yeah. because people will default to stupid. Exactly. So, so I mean, one option is the, the default, you know, you create in the system where the system in some ways defaults to the smartest solution rather than the stupidest one. But the problem is that in financial <laughs> service providers, exactly, it's better for the financial service provider. This is what they've done with pensions, right? So you default to actually you getting a pension versus not kind of thing. And there's many other examples of this. But it's a great point that there's a big role here for systems designers to to have this default or slowing decisions down or things like this, which default to a better decision. So thank you. Thank you very much. Thank, you. thank, thank you, you again. Thank you.